Chapter 11 is going to be about the fat-soluble vitamins. The first fat-soluble vitamin is vitamin A. Now, vitamin A has lots of different forms. We have three active forms of vitamin A, which we call retinol esters. Those are retinol, retinol, and retinoic acid. And then we have a precursor of vitamin A, which is called beta-carotene. That means that it's not an actual active vitamin A, but when beta-carotene enters the body, it's converted into vitamin A. If you take a look here, you see the three retinal esters, which we said are active vitamin A. They're all at the top and look um, pretty similar. And then if you look at the one at the bottom, you have beta-carotene. Now, if we split beta-carotene straight down the middle, it's going to look pretty much like the uh, retinal esters that we have at the top there. So that's usually how this is going to go. So beta-carotene will enter the body and then it will be split. If it gets split down the middle, it'll make two vitamin A. If it gets split somewhere else, it'll only make one. It doesn't um, split straight down the middle very often, so it usually doesn't make two. It's um, less efficient at making vitamin A, but it does convert um, to some degree. Now, we also have different roles depending on the type of vitamin A and different sources. The three retinal esters we can find in animal foods but beta-carotene can only be found in plant foods. And beta-carotene is what gives that orange pigment. So it's gonna be found in things like carrots, squash, pumpkin. Those types of foods are gonna be rich in beta-carotene. And then when they enter the body, they can convert to the other forms of vitamin A. So let's go ahead and take a look at the different roles. Now, one of the main roles of vitamin A is reproduction and growth. Starting off with the man, the vitamin A is going to help with healthy sperm development so that the sperm can actually fertilize an egg. Now, if the woman becomes pregnant, it's also going to help with the development of the baby throughout the pregnancy. And even after the baby is born, it's going to help with the process we call bone remodeling. If you remember, we mentioned that bones go through somewhat of a turnover process, just like muscles do, where they undo their structure and then rebuild to take on a new shape, a new form to be stronger and bigger. Uh, bones do something like this throughout life, especially during the period where a child is growing and the bones are growing longer. And vitamin A helps with this role because it helps break down the bone structure so that it can be rebuilt to a newer, different shaped bone. Another role for vitamin A is that it is going to act as an antioxidant, so it will fight free radicals, and this is going to be primarily in the form of beta-carotene. One other really important role is the role it has in maintaining your vision. So let's go ahead and look at how that actually happens. So before we talk about vitamin A's role in vision, let's go ahead and learn a little bit about how our eyes function in the first place to allow us to see an image. So here you have a picture of an eye and it shows you that the very outer layer of the eye is called the cornea. What happens is when you look at something, the light is going to pass your cornea in order to enter your eye, and then it's going to hit the back of your eye, which we call the retina. Now, in the retina, this is going to be where vitamin A is going to play its role, because the retina has a protein that is attached to vitamin A. And when light hits this protein, the protein is going to flip and change structure. And since vitamin A is attached to it, the vitamin A will also flip. So at this point, when this change happens to the protein and vitamin A structure, that's going to trigger an electrical impulse, which will send the image to your brain and you're able to see the image. 
This is going to happen every single time you look at something. And the reason that we need to keep consuming vitamin A is because when we get to the part where your retina um, is receiving the light and the protein located in the retina is changing structure along with the vitamin A, once the vitamin A changes stru structure and stimulates that electrical impulse, it actually drops off. It breaks off of the protein and is released, and we need to then replenish an, the vitamin A. So we constantly need to have a supply of vitamin A so that every time we view an image, that vitamin A breaks off of the retina, we can attach another vitamin A there so that we can see the image, um, so that we can see the next image. Now, if you have, um, let's say that you have an issue with the uh, vitamin A supply, you're not getting a steady vitamin A supply, and it starts to affect the replenishing rate in your retina. So you see something, the vitamin A drops off, but we don't replace that vitamin A quickly enough because you're not getting a steady supply of vitamin A. What will happen is what we call night blindness. So when you have a vitamin A deficiency that's affecting your retina, you're going to develop night blindness, which is basically when you look at something in the dark, normally, once um, it gets dark, it takes your eyes a few seconds to adjust and you're able to see a little bit better. People with night blindness don't adjust as well or at all once the lights are off. Also, if you were to flash a bright light at someone, it usually bl blinds them for a couple of seconds and then they're able to see again. For someone who has night blindness, it takes them a lot longer to recover from that flash of light. Now another thing can happen if you have a deficiency of vitamin A or you just don't have a steady supply of vitamin A and that is it can actually start to affect your cornea. Now one of the other roles of vitamin A that we're going to discuss um, in more detail in a second is that it helps to keep your cells healthy, in particular the cells that form mucus. Mucus is something that keeps the cells moist so that they can be flexible, they can allow things to enter and leave, and if the cells don't have that mucus, the cells will dry up and become really hard, and things can't permeate through them, and those cells can't function properly. Now, if you have a deficiency of vitamin A, that can actually happen to your cornea where your cornea dries up and becomes extremely hard to the point where nothing can penetrate your eye because remember the cornea is the very outer layer. So what will happen is your cornea hardens up when you look at something and the light is trying to enter your eye, it will not be able to enter and so you won't be able to see at all. So if you have a vitamin A deficiency that's affecting your retina, the vitamin A located in your retina, then the person will develop night blindness. If they have a vitamin A deficiency affecting the cornea, you will have total blindness because the light won't be able to enter at all. This is the role that I was referring to where vitamin A helps keep the cells moist by keeping um, the cells producing mucus. Now in the picture that you see here, we have on the left a picture of a cell membrane where the cells are plump and moist because there is enough vitamin A. Now if the person was deficient in vitamin A, those cells are going to start to harden up, they're going to start to dry up and shrink to the point where they no longer function. And that's what you see in the second picture there on the far right. If the cells do dry up and shrink because of a lack of moisture, we call that keratinization. So this can happen in an outward way where the skin becomes extremely dry and scaly, but it can also happen 
in a less obvious way where it starts to um, affect the cells in your digestive system. If you remember, we said the uh, nutrients get absorbed into the small intestine by absorbing into the cells that line the intestinal wall. If those cells dried up and stopped functioning, then your nutrients wouldn't be able to penetrate, they wouldn't be able to absorb into those cells anymore. So one thing that can happen is as your nutrients pass your intestine, if the intestine has all of these dry, hardened cells, the nutrients are not going to be absorbed properly. So you can end up with deficiencies because of this. This is a picture of the keratinization that presents itself on the skin. So as you can see, it's a very extreme version of very dry, rough, bumpy skin. So here we have um, other deficiency uh, conditions that can happen. We already talked about the two at the bottom, the night blindness and the total blindness. But another thing that can also happen is being more vulnerable to infectious diseases. Vitamin A toxicities are things that can happen since we are now talking about fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, fat-soluble vitamins are stored in our body, so it's very easy to develop toxicity from them. Now, we said that vitamin A is important for our bone remodeling because it helps break down the bone so it can rebuild. But if you have too much vitamin A, your bones will basically start breaking down at a faster rate than rebuilding, and you can end up with really weak bones. Another thing that it can do is it can actually cause major birth defects if a mother takes a lot of vitamin A during her pregnancy. When it comes to getting too much vitamin A in the form of beta carotene, that's something that we're not really uh, too concerned about because the conversion rate that our body has when we're referring to converting beta carotene to vitamin A is actually not that efficient. So even if you consume a bunch of beta carotene, it's probably not going to convert to enough vitamin A for toxicity to develop. Um, if it did, the most common way it would present itself is by altering the color of your skin. Since beta carotene has that orange yellow pigment, that can start to show up in the individual skin. Now, if the toxicity was to the point um, where it was really extreme, let's say the individual was taking um, extreme amounts of beta carotene supplements, what can happen is the antioxidant function of beta carotene will actually become the opposite. When you have too much of an antioxidant, it turns into what we call a pro-oxidant. A pro-oxidant is something that promotes free radical production instead of um, fighting free radicals. This here shows us the discoloration of skin that can happen when beta carotene is consumed in excess. It's just a temporary condition that will go away once the individual stops consuming the large amounts of beta carotene. The next fat-soluble vitamin is vitamin D. We can get vitamin D from foods. We can also get it from our body manufacturing vitamin D. Now, either way, regardless of how we, which source we get the vitamin D from, the vitamin D needs to be activated. And the way that it's going to be activated is by going through two hydroxylation reactions. Hydroxylation means adding hydrogen and oxygen, and that needs to happen twice, once in the liver and then in the kidneys. After this, vitamin D is active and can go ahead and play its roles. Now, this over here is going to show us how our body can go ahead and make vitamin D and then how it's going to be activated. So we start off with the cholesterol that's already in our body. 
If you remember, we looked at cholesterol in the fat chapter, and we saw that the structure of cholesterol is actually very close to the structure of vitamin D. And so we actually use the cholesterol in your body, in your skin, to convert it to vitamin D. And this is done by exposure to the sun. So when your skin gets exposed to sunlight, the cholesterol in your skin is going to be converted to a form of vitamin D. Now, when we get this vitamin D from the body, remember it still needs to be activated, just like if we got the vitamin D from foods. And remember we said this is going to happen through hydroxylation reactions, which is adding hydrogen and oxygen. So we start off with one hydroxylation reaction in the liver and then another hydroxylation reaction in the kidneys and finally we have an active version of vitamin D. So again one more time our skin is exposed to the sunlight. The cholesterol in the skin is going to convert to vitamin D and then our body will activate vitamin D through hydroxylation in the liver and the kidney. Now that we know how vitamin D is going to be activated, let's go ahead and take a look at what its role is going to be once it is active. Now that role is primarily helping our bones. Calcium is going to be the main mineral that our bones are composed of and without vitamin D, calcium is not able to be absorbed. And the way that this works is that calcium needs to bind to a specific protein in order for it to be absorbed. Without being bound to this protein, calcium will just enter our body and then leave through our urine. Vitamin D helps to make this protein that calcium needs to attach to. So if you didn't have vitamin D, we wouldn't make that protein and then calcium would have nothing to bind to and it would just leave our body. So vitamin D is just as important as calcium when it comes to your bone health. A lot of times people tend to neglect vitamin D and just focus on calcium, but the calcium is just going to leave your body if vitamin D isn't there to help your body absorb it. So if an individual didn't get enough vitamin D, um, they can develop a deficiency. Even though we said that fat-soluble vitamins are less likely to develop deficiencies since our body stores it, vitamin D deficiency is actually very common. And one of the reasons for this is that it's not really found in many uh, food sources. It's pretty much in things like fortified milk, eggs, salmon, and those are pretty much the main sources for vitamin D. So if an individual doesn't consume those few sources, they're not going to get much vitamin D. Another reason is these days we really don't get out in the sun as much as we used to. So for individuals who aren't getting out in the sun much and then don't consume those few food sources, they're not going to be getting their vitamin D. Now, some individuals also might live in an area where they don't get much sunlight. So in those cases, they're going to probably need to take a supplement. So the deficiency conditions that develop when you lack vitamin D are going to look very similar to calcium deficiencies. And again, this is because the main role of vitamin D is to help us absorb calcium. So if we're missing vitamin D, we're not going to absorb calcium and our bones are going to suffer. And the two bone diseases are called rickets and osteomalacia. They are both basically weak bones because calcium is not being absorbed. Rickets is the one that affects children and osteomalacia is the condition that affects adults.
Vitamin D toxicity is not as common as the deficiency, but if it does happen, what it's going to do is cause too much calcium to be absorbed. And if you have too much calcium in your body, it's going to start depositing in your tissues since your bones already have enough. And if it deposits in your tissues, it can harden up things that we actually need to be flexible. For example, your blood vessels, like your veins and arteries, they need to be uh, flexible so that the blood can flow um, easily through them. If your blood vessels start to receive calcium, if they start to have calcium deposits into them, the blood vessels can harden up and become really inflexible, which can really hinder the blood flow. Next we have vitamin E. The main role for vitamin E is to act as an antioxidant. It's actually the main antioxidant for our body's defense. It's one of the strongest antioxidants. Both vitamin E deficiencies and toxicities are fairly rare, but if a deficiency were to develop, what's going to happen is your red blood cells are going to be more vulnerable to damage, and they can start to weaken and break and then release their contents. Lastly, we have our vitamin K. Now, vitamin K has two main sources. Those are going to be your green leafy vegetables, but then also your body. Our body actually makes vitamin K. And this is using the bacteria in our intestines. Everybody has bacteria that naturally forms in their body. And some of that bacteria is good bacteria. And the ones in our intestines can actually form vitamin K. So even if you're not getting enough vitamin K from your foods, your body is still going to be making at least half of the vitamin K that you need. The main role of vitamin K is to help our blood clot. When we get some kind of wound or cut, we want our blood to be able to clot to prevent excessive bleeding that could, really, that could lead to a much bigger um, health concern. And vitamin K helps our blood do that. Another role of vitamin K is helping our um, bones remain healthy. And the way that it's going to do this is by directing calcium to deposit into our bones. Remember, calcium doesn't necessarily have to deposit into the bones. It can deposit into our tissue or go elsewhere. And so vitamin K is going to direct vitamin K to deposit into our bones. And the way that it does this is it makes a protein inside of the bone that kind of acts like a magnet for calcium. Calcium can bind onto this protein inside of our bones and that way the calcium deposits into the bone and not elsewhere. So if you think about the two main, um, the two main vitamins that are going to be helping direct calcium, vitamin D is going to be kind of like the gatekeeper that lets calcium into our body, lets calcium absorb, and then vitamin K is kind of like the traffic cop that's directing calcium on where to go. When it comes to deficiencies and toxicities, deficiency is pretty rare since our body already makes half of what we need, with the exception of newborn infants. Newborn infants actually need to receive an injection of vitamin K when they're born. And the reason for this is because the mother's milk doesn't contain sufficient vitamin K. And then also they're not receiving any from their body because remember it's the bacteria in our body that forms vitamin K. The baby is located in the um, very sterile environment inside of the mother until it's born. And so once the baby is born, it's not going to have any bacteria in its body. So it's not going to be able to make its own vitamin K. 
once it is exposed to the environment after birth, the bacteria will start to build up in the infant's uh, body and then the baby can make its own vitamin K. But as soon as it's born, it's going to need a vitamin K injection. Toxicities are also not common. They actually don't even have an upper limit for vitamin K because they haven't seen any kind of negative effects from getting too much. Now, the one exception is if you are taking anti-blood clotting medication or anticoagulants, then you might be concerned about the amount of vitamin K that you consume. And this is because anticoagulants are given to individuals who have a problem with their blood clotting too much. So we want our blood to clot so that we can prevent excessive bleeding, but we don't want it to clot excessively because that can cause different health issues and it can actually end up bleeding to death. So we um, sometimes give individuals anti-blood clotting medications if they do have that issue. Now, if you are taking a bunch of vitamin K, vitamin K causes your blood to clot. It helps your blood to clot. So if you already have too much blood clotting and you're on medication to stop that, then you want to make sure that you're not taking a bunch of vitamin K because that's just going to defeat the purpose of the medication that you're on.